Thank you, Drew. Good evening. Welcome to worship here at Incarnation Lutheran Church. My name is Joel Vanderwell. I'm one of the pastors here. If you're worshiping with us online, thanks for being here as a part of our service uh, during Lent. One of the things that we often will be doing, and you've already experienced this, is just a chance to get away maybe from the busyness of your day uh, and just allow ourselves to enter into God's presence. Uh, we've done that already through the beautiful music that Drew and Amy led us in. Uh, but now we're going to take a few moments of silence just to collect ourselves, maybe take a deep breath, and allow ourselves just to enter into God's Spirit. So throughout this Lenten series, we've been looking at different spiritual practices that we'll be doing, and tonight we're going to be focusing on frugality. Um, some of you know this, but I'm Dutch, and one of the things that Dutch people are known for is being very cheap. Um, so much so that I was, when I was in college, I delivered pizzas, uh, and I would go and deliver them in this Dutch town, and the bill would be like 1987. And out of the generosity of people's hearts, they would give me a 20 and tell me to keep the change. Like, and it wasn't, it wasn't every time. I mean, probably half the time I had to reach in and give them 13 cents back. Um, this sense of Dutch cheapness, I, I think, too, of another example of like when uh, one of my college professors uh, who was talking to one of my classmates about how he like visited a restaurant where she was working at and she had served him and and he just asked her hey do you know why I didn't leave a tip and she was like no I was really baffled by that because I thought you liked me like I thought I was a good student and he said well it took a long time for me to get our food and a tip stands for to ensure promptness if you know anything about the word insure, that's not the right word insure. It's, it's, but in his mind, if he didn't get his food in a timely manner, what he considered to be timely, he wouldn't leave a tip. And he was totally okay with that. It, it goes beyond just tipping. Um, it's also like when a man and I used to buy four Sunday papers so that we could get quadruple the coupons and save 80 cents on toilet paper. It's, it's this kind of thing that I grew up in, that uh, it's, it's being cheap. It's almost like this pride that you get out of it. It's, 
It's when you're talking to a friend and they tell you, oh, I, I got gas today and I only spent 326. And you say, yeah, I spent 325. <laughs> Not telling them you drove the next town over to a gas station and it took you 20 miles to get there. There's this, there's almost like this pride that Dutch people get about talking about how cheap they are. And it's, it's more than, it goes beyond frugality in that way, okay? When, when we're talking about frugality, it's not necessarily about being cheap. That's not the sense that Jesus has in mind or what we think of for spiritual disciplines. Um, being frugal is more about the changing of the mind and the heart and the pocketbook. Now, one of the things that Martin Luther talks about is these three conversions that a person may experience, the mind, the heart, and the pocketbook. Uh, and he's not talking about it like in a linear fashion. Uh, it's just over time, those conversions happen to us over and over again. So the mind is about the way that we think about God or understand who God might be. The heart is about the way in which we encounter God in the world or show God to other people in the world. And the pocketbook is about the way we choose to spend our money. Um, frugality combines all three of those and requires and asks of us actually to, to go through a conversion of all three of those, of the mind, the heart, and the pocketbook. Uh, this, the passage that we're going to look at tonight comes from the Gospel of Matthew, and it's, uh, again, more about the Sermon on the Mount. We've studied a little bit of this in the past. A couple of weeks ago, Pastor Kai preached about fasting, and you may remember he used that text Next week, when we talk about intercession, we'll use another part of the Sermon on the Mount. Um, one of the reasons for this is, as Jesus is talking to his followers, he's talking about things they can do and the way in which they practice their faith in real life. So in the Sermon on the Mount, especially in chapter 6, he lists all these different practices. He begins with prayer, then he talks about giving of alms, then he talks about fasting, and now he talks about um, actually kind of the way in which you, you, where it is that you put your treasures um, and, and what it is that is meaningful to you. So if you have your Bibles or if you want to look it up on your phone, we're in Matthew 6, starting in verse 19. Hear these words from the book that we love. Jesus says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust consume or where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasure in heaven where moths or rust do not consume and where thieves do not break in and steal for where your treasure is there your heart will be also the eye is the lamp to the body so if your eye is healthy your whole body is full of light but if your eye is unhealthy your whole body will be full of darkness if then the light in you is darkness how great is the darkness no one can serve two masters for a slave will either hate the one and love the other or be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and wealth. I don't know if you ever feel this way, but the more that I read of Jesus' teachings and the more I encounter the things that Jesus did, I can't help but think he is very un-American. <laughs> Does anybody else feel that way about Jesus? You cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve both God and wealth. I think what Jesus is getting at is, is the sense of where your heart, what it is that the, you depend upon, what it is that you put your trust in, is really the fullness of who you are. It reveals to other people where it is that you're going. Frugality in and of itself is actually this practice of putting your trust in God, of believing that God is going to be able to provide for you all that you need. That's ultimately what the practice of frugality lives into. Do I really believe that God is going to provide for what I need? So if, consider for a moment, and maybe you need to close your eyes, but imagine your refrigerator, your freezer, and your cupboard, and all the food that is in those places. If there were to be a bad snowstorm tonight, 
and you weren't able to get out of your house, how long do you think you and your family could live off of the food that's in your freezer and fridge and cupboards? What do you think? There's no like right or wrong answer, I'm just curious. Months? Yeah. Like right when the pandemic hit, we panicked and bought a whole ton of rice and black beans that we still have from three years ago. <laughs> and then if worse came to worse, we could live off of that for a really long time. Yeah. I think a lot of times anxiety feeds into that. That, that the anxiety we have of, of not enough um, prevents us from maybe more fully trusting in what God has for us. Taking the discipline action of practicing frugality allows us to trust in God in a different way. And what I'm going to read for you, you're going to hear Jesus say six times, do not worry, over and over and over again. Um, and he's talking to a group of people who don't have refrigerators or freezers or cupboards. He's talking to a group of people who are living in this moment of scarcity where, where they may not know where their next meal is coming from. And listen to the way in which Jesus instructs them. He says to them, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body and what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more value than they? And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things. And indeed, your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. <laughs> Here's the line that gets me. Today's troubles are enough for today. Six times Jesus says, do not worry. Do not worry about what you will eat. Do not worry about what you will drink. Do not worry about being clothed. But he doesn't just say, do not worry about it. He then goes on to say, consider the birds of the air. They don't harvest, they don't have a barn to put their food in, and yet your heavenly Father loves those birds enough to feed them. Consider the lilies of the field. They do not toil nor spin clothes, and yet in all their glory they're more splendid than, than Solomon himself. I think that's kind of the point. That looking around us, we can see God's providence over and over and over again. And that if, if birds of the air, if the lilies of the field are able to put their trust in their creator, then why can't we? The gift in the practice of frugality invites us to live into that even more so. And so I... I think of this, this quote from Richard War in uh, one of his books, it was published maybe 10 years ago, called Struggling Upward. Uh, maybe some of you have read that book. One of the things that he says as he's much older now, he says, I'm not preoccupied with collecting more goods and services. Quite simply, my desire and effort every day is to pay back, to give back to the world a bit of what I have received. And I realize that I have been gratuitously given to from the universe, from society, and from God. I try now, as Elizabeth Seaton said, to live simply so others can simply live. Frugality is living that out in a daily way.
to live simply so others can simply live. And so I want to suggest maybe just three ways that that you might try to do this. Knowing that Jesus talked about food and water and clothes, I'm just going to use those as examples. So food, maybe maybe what you do is you decide between now and Easter or for a whole week as a household, as a family, we're going to decide to not eat out. We're just going to eat what we have. And then perhaps the money that you save from that, you can use to either buy groceries for the Ralph Reader food shelf that's going on, or maybe you could choose to use that money to donate to Feed My Starving Children and the upcoming mobile pack that's coming up. Or maybe consider water. And this one may be a a longer one, one that you may have to wait for, but maybe this summer, instead of watering your lawn, You allow God to water it naturally through rain. And the money that you save from watering that lawn, you decide we're going to invest in organizations that find ways to bring clean water to people who need it. Or maybe for clothes. You decide, you know, instead of spending money on brand new clothes, maybe for a season we'll decide to buy our clothes at a thrift shop. And instead of using that money to buy those clothes for ourselves, maybe we donate that money to solid ground for the coat drive that we'll be doing this fall. Live simply so that others may simply live. That's the gift of frugality. It's not about being cheap and being able to brag about it. It's about this gift that we can give to other people. So I invite you this season, maybe this summer, to consider ways in which you can live simply so others can simply live. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
And as we pray together, after each petition, I will say, Lord, in your mercy, and I invite you to respond. Hear our prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, gracious Father, in the presence of your bounty, keep us humble. In the presence of all people's needs, make us compassionate and caring. Give us faith in our praying and love in our serving, knowing that by your power all may find a new balance in living and a new victory in adversity. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, we pray for those who are lonely, who are shy and self-conscious, who find it hard to make friends, for those who are nervous and timid, who forever feel themselves strangers in the world they can scarcely understand. May your presence inspire confidence and ensure companionship. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all illness and in pain, weary of the day and fearful of the night. In the silence now, we lift up to you the concerns of our own hearts, even those that are too difficult to put to words. Grant healing, O Lord, and at all times through faith the gift of your indwelling peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless us each one in the communion of saints and keep us ever mindful of the great cloud of witnesses that following in their steps as they did in the steps of the Master, we may with them at last receive the fulfillment promised to your people. Through Jesus Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. I invite you now to please stand and join me in singing our closing song, Abide With Me. Go with this blessing. Let us claim the freedom Christ gives us by his self-giving on the cross. May he enable us to serve together in faith, hope, and love. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks for worshiping with us. We'll see you again next Wednesday. If you want to take a moment to say hi to those around you, please do so now.